Hola, mi nombre es Coralia Castellanos, soy de Guatemala. Me vine hace 21 años con mi amiga, acompañada de mi amiga. Empezamos a pasar fronteras, Belice, México, mucho tiempo en autobuses, nos bajábamos, nos subíamos en otros para huyendo de la migración mexicana. Así pudimos llegar hasta Tijuana a los ocho días, sufriendo mucho, hambre, frío y todo. Nos metieron en una camioneta. Caminamos muchas horas hasta llegar a una camioneta. Eh, en esa camioneta era una camioneta no muy grande, bastante pequeña. Íbamos como 30, 35 personas, uno arriba de otras, casi asfixiándonos. Corrimos horas, horas sin saber a dónde íbamos hasta que nos dijeron que habíamos llegado a Los Ángeles. Oh, me vine porque necesitaba ayudar a mi familia. I have been close to Cora's family for the greater part of my life and never once bothered to hear her story of coming to Los Angeles from Guatemala. When I was young, I would often imagine my own home near Los Angeles from the eyes of someone standing at its fence looking in. Sometimes I'd see myself as the host greeting guests. Other times I'd be those strangers, like Cora was, standing at my own door. My confused sense of the stranger is common in divided cities near the border. Here the first and third worlds lie cheek to cheek, where migrants from Mexico, Central, and South America cross, legally and illegally. It's not always obvious who is hosting whom in these cities. Los Angeles' population is almost 50% Hispanic or Latino. We mix, and we always have. It's easy to get swept into one side over the other, amidst the heated political debate here. But that has nothing to do with the yes, fact that he does. was a drunk. He should have been he was deported. A drunk. What if, he, he should have been deported. You, and this mayor and a police chief didn't deport him. Listen, do you know how many people we have in But nearly everybody who lives in Los Angeles knows someone with a story like Cora's, however they stand on immigration. We face the stranger daily and still struggle when it comes to speaking with them. So how do I reach the distant stranger beyond my close friends? And once I find them, what can I say? The border itself poses great problems for exchanging dialogue. In order to first learn about its effects on Los Angeles, I sought the help of Edward Casey, a professor at SUNY Stony Brook who has explored this area for over five years. Borders are always culturally, historically, politically constructed entities. They're, they're, they're not found in, in nature. As, as I understand them. They are imposed, they are created, they're constructed, um, uh, they are drawn, uh, they're often the creature of treaties, international treaties, for example, in the case of the kind of border we're talking about, it goes back to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, the U.S.-Mexico border was entirely a creation of that discursive document. On the western end of this border, sprouting out of the Pacific Ocean, we find a 14-mile wall built to keep migrants out indefinitely, but they have found ways to avoid it. Most notably, recently, it's the drug cartels who are very ingenious at tunneling under the wall. Vast tunnels, air-conditioned, well-lit, um, uh, easy avenues back and forth for drug traffic. Before that, uh, immigrants uh, who are now down to a trickle for various economic and historical reasons, nevertheless being equally ingenious in finding ways to scale it, even to cut through it, and above all, to go around it. I think your question, the deeper part of your question that I like a lot, is that I do believe Border Patrol agents should leave a margin of indeterminacy for the possibility that they could be more hospitable and more open to anyone, indeed, they encounter in their work. 
But once more at the level of what I'm calling, you know, daily realism, it's going to be tough. And it's going to be very tough to take the time to figure out whether a given person, you know, is play acting, uh, might be a really vicious drug lord, or at least someone affiliated with the cartel, pretending to be just an ordinary worker, you see. The daily task of discerning between the sincere and the dangerous seemed to be my biggest problem. In trying to solve this, I met with a local detective, Joel Price, who has extensive experience in Los Angeles law enforcement and knows what it means to be a host among potentially hostile strangers. I think when I think of the word host and, and versus stranger, uh, I think of a host as being somebody who is allowing someone to to visit them, to uh, come and spend time with them uh, on an invitation basis. Uh, and or somebody who has gone through the process to uh, complete whatever documentation and obtain whatever permissions they need in order to come and in this case into another country. I get I guess I get the question. Um, I don't really know I know how to respond to the host portion of it. I don't really know how to respond to the stranger portion of it. Or maybe I have. I don't know. Joel shared in my confusion of the stranger's position. But he did mention efforts to reconnect with immigrants through a mandate Chief Daryl Gates implemented in 1979 called Special Order 40. With this in place, policemen in Los Angeles cannot seek out an immigrant solely to judge their legal status. Daryl Gates um, signed this Special Order 40 into, into laws because he saw, even back in 1979, that the population in Los Angeles was changing and that um, we didn't want people who were here illegally to be fearful of the police. We didn't want them to, to not report crimes for fear that their status in the U.S. would be questioned and that they would then be removed. And that, that, has, that has continued to be the case uh, for the last 30 some odd years since, since I've been a member of the department. And I think it's the right way to do things. I really do. Uh, that's not to say that at the same time, I don't think that we can do better. If safety's at risk, then I think um, hospitality, something has to give there. Uh, if the fact that we're um, by allowing these people here, it's creating a risk for those of us who are here legally, then I, I would find it difficult or more difficult to be hospitable toward them. After such problems Joel Price and other law officers face daily, drug wars, guns trafficking, and outstanding murder warrants, it seemed dialogue had to take a back seat for them. But even with the dangers of approaching the stranger, someone had to be trying to reconnect with migrants while still keeping safety in mind. After searching for such humanitarian efforts, I finally came across an initiative called the Water Station, a group of men and women who have built and restocked small oases of water along the deserts of Southern California simply because they were tired of the growing death toll of migrants at the border. Interested in the water station's goals, I contacted their founder John Hunter and his wife Laura and decided to meet with them for a Saturday in a town only a few miles north of the border. Driving down uninhabited desert roads, we were simply told to refill barrels with one gallon jugs of store-bought water. Those close to dehydration or death can easily see these blue and orange oases. We 
eventually returned to the cafe for a lunch break. I was able to sit down and ask the group how they began such controversial work and why they have continued doing it for over 11 years. This is my backyard. I live about 100 miles from here. And they have all these people dying these horrible deaths with no, uh, no strong effort made to stop it. To me, is un-American. I kept going to these meetings where they ostensibly were gonna have to try and do something to stop the deaths of the migrants, <clears throat> but there was just a lot of this, okay? I do come from a conservative family. I'm a Republican, although I tend to, tend to vote for uh, whoever I feel like it these days. Uh, you know, I always thought we were the good guys, and the good guys don't let innocent people die in their backyards, right? But two weeks ago, there were two young guys in the desert. They had gotten separated from their group. I presume that a coyote was leading their group. They got separated from their group. They were down in the canyon we visited, which is uh, Carrizo Creek or Carrizo Gorge. Um, and the first thing they'd done is they'd found our water. They could have been in danger for their lives without that. Eventually, um, they turned themselves into the Border Patrol and went back to Mexico. Now, to me, that's a good outcome. The most shocking moment was in 2003, when I encountered 17 people in that same area, Carrizo. You know, it really bothered me. It really saddened me. And I get a little bit emotional. Sorry. I cannot imagine what it's like. I'm sorry. To come across and walk for days because they're trying to provide for their families. See, it was not my situation. It was not my family situation. But to me, those people are heroes, like the ones that don't make it from the war defending this country. Even with this clear message of saving lives, it's difficult to get that point across to everyone. What if migrants plan their routes according to these spots? What if I just gave water to a criminal? So was I closer to approaching the stranger after all? I learned more than I had anticipated out here, and I did cross a Rubicon in starting this project, even if meaningful dialogue at the opposite shore was still out of reach. I was holding on to something John Hunter mentioned about protecting his own backyard. Maybe it was naive to travel around California and miss the distant strangers on my own street. So what about a forum in my community where I invite the strangers who live just next door? I contacted local outreach programs, teachers, friends, and decided to set a day in the park where Latino immigrants and non-immigrants could speak in a casual setting. Eventually, the local newspaper became interested. I was able to meet with three immigrants willing to tell their stories to us. Monica Garcia came over from Peru and now works for an immigration service website in Los Angeles. Veronica Bass came from Mexico and became a math and Spanish teacher at our local high school. And the Najiqueros crossed the border multiple times from Mexico. She is still undocumented, but an outspoken activist in the community. Yet as anyone could tell, immigrants were still apprehensive about showing up to this forum or speaking on camera. I might have only found that forums like these help you begin the conversation. To sense the call of the stranger and answer back simply, sit down with me and we'll start from there.